Crawling up the gentle slope on his belly, Perrin peered over the crest into a scene from the Dark One's dreams. The wolves had given him some notion of what to expect, but notions paled beside reality. Perhaps a mile from where he lay beneath the midday sun, a huge milling mass of Shido completely surrounded what seemed to be a ring of wagons and men centered on a small clump of trees not far from the road. A number of the wagons were bonfires, flames dancing. Balls of fire, small as a fist and large as boulders, hurtled into the Aiel. Gouts of fire flared, turning a dozen at a time to torches. Lightning fell from a cloudless sky, hurling earth and cotton sore clad figures into the air. But silver flashes of lightning struck at the wagons, too, and fire leaped from the Aiel. Much of that fire suddenly died or exploded short of any target. Many of the lightning bolts stopped abruptly. But if the battle seemed slightly in favor of the Aes Sedai, the sheer number of Shido had to prove overwhelming eventually. There must be two or three hundred women channeling down there, if not more. Karuna, lying beside him, sounded impressed. Soralea, beyond the green sister, certainly looked impressed. The wise one smelled concerned, not afraid, but troubled. I have never seen so many weaves at once, the Aes Sedai went on. I think there are at least thirty sisters in the camp. You have brought us to a boiling cauldron, young Ebara. Forty thousand Shido, Ruark muttered grimly on Perrin's other side. He even smelled grim. Forty thousand at the least, and small satisfaction to know why they did not send more south. The Lord Dragon is down there, Dobrain asked, looking across Ruark. Perrin nodded. And you mean to go in there and bring him out? Perrin nodded again, and Dobrain sighed. He smelled resigned, not afraid. We will go in, Lord Ebara, but I do not believe we will come out. This time, Ruark nodded. Karuna looked at the men. You do realize there are not enough of us. Nine. Even if your wise ones can actually channel to any effect, we are not enough to match that. Soralea snorted loudly, but Karuna kept her eyes where they were. Then turn around and ride south, Perrin told her. I'll not let Elida have Rand. Good, Karuna replied, smiling. Because I will not either. He wished her smile did not make his skin crawl. Of course, had she seen the malevolent look Soralea directed at the back of her head, her skin might have crawled too. Perrin signaled to those at the bottom of the ridge, and Soralea and the green slid down until they could straighten, then hurried in opposite directions. First to move were the two rivers men and the winged guards, divided into two companies, one surrounding wise ones afoot, and the other mounted Aes Sedai and warders. To left and right, they crossed the ridge. Danil had let them bring out the Red Eagle again, in addition to the Red Wolf Head. Ruark did not even glance toward where Amis walked not far from Karuna's dark gelding, but Perrin heard him murmur, May we see the sun rise together, shade of my heart. At the end, the Mayeners and Two Rivers men were to cover the Wise Ones in Aes Sedai in retreat, or maybe it would be the other way around. In either case, Bera and Karuna did not seem to like the plan. They very much wanted to be where Rand was. Are you sure you will not ride, Lord Ibarra? Dobrain asked from his saddle. To him, the notion of fighting on foot was anathema. Perrin patted the axe hanging at his hip. This is not much use from horseback. It was, in truth, but he did not want to ride Stepper or Stayer into what lay ahead. Men could choose whether they threw themselves into the midst of steel and death. He chose for his horses... And today, he chose no. Maybe you'll lend me a stirrup when the time comes. Dobrain blinked. Karienin made little use of foot soldiers, but he seemed to understand and nodded. It is time for the pipers to play the dance, Ruark said, lifting his black veil, though today there would be no pipers playing, which some of the Aiel did not like. Many of the maidens did not like the required strips of red cloth tied around their arms to distinguish them from Shido maidens for the wetlanders. They seemed to think anyone should know at a glance. Black-veiled maidens and Siswayamon began trotting up the slope in a thick column, 
and Perrin walked with Dobrain to where Loyal already stood at the head of the Kyrienen, gripping his axe in both hands and ears laid back. Aram was there too, afoot and his sword bare. The former tinker wore a dark smile of anticipation. Dobrain waved his arm for the advance, behind Rand's twin banners, and saddles creaked as a small forest of five hundred lances climbed beside the Aiel. Nothing had changed in the battle, which surprised Perrin until he realized only moments had passed since he last saw it. The time had seemed longer. The great mass of Shido still pressed inward, wagons still burned, perhaps more than before. Lightning still struck from the sky and fire leaped in balls and billows. The two rivers men were almost to their position, with the Mayeners and Aes Sedai and Wise Ones, moving almost unhurriedly across the rolling plain. Perrin would have held them farther back, to give them a better chance at escape when the time came for that, but Danil kept insisting they had to close to at least three hundred paces for their bows to be effective, and Urella had been just as anxious not to hang back. Even the Aes Sedai, who Perrin was sure only had to be near enough to see clearly, had insisted. None of the Shido had looked around yet. At least none were pointing at the threat moving slowly toward their backs. None were wheeling about to face it. All seemed fixed on rushing at the circle of wagons, falling back before fire and lightning, then rushing in again. All it would take would be one looking behind. But the inferno ahead held them. Eight hundred paces. Seven hundred. The two rivers men dismounted, taking bows in hand. Six hundred. Five. Four. Dobrain drew his sword, raised it high. The Lord Dragon, Tamerwin, and victory! He shouted, and the shout came from five hundred throats as lances snapped down. Perrin had just time to seize hold of Dobrain's stirrup before the Kyrienen were thundering forward. Loyal's long legs matched the horse's pace for pace. Loping along, letting the horse pull him in long leaping strides, Perrin sent his mind out. Come. Ground covered with brown grass, seemingly empty, suddenly gave birth to a thousand wolves. Lean brown plains wolves, and some of their darker, heavier forest cousins. Running low to hurl themselves into the backs of the Shido with snapping jaws, just as the first long two rivers shafts rained out of the sky beyond them. A second flight already arched high. New lightnings fell with the arrows, new fires bloomed. Veiled Shido turning to fight wolves had only moments to realize they were not the only threat before a solid spear of Aiel stabbed into them alongside a hammer of Kyrian and lances. Snatching his axe free, Perrin hacked down a Shido in his way and leaped over the man as he fell. They had to reach Rand. Everything rested on that. Beside him, Loyal's great axe rose and fell and swung, carving a path. Aram seemed to dance with his sword, laughing as he cut down everyone in his way. There was no time to think of anyone else. Perrin worked his axe methodically. He was hewing wood, not flesh. He tried not to see the blood that spurted, even when Crimson sprayed his face. He had to reach Rand. He was slashing a path through brambles. All he focused on was the man in front of him. He thought of them as men, even when Height said it might be a maiden. He was not sure he could swing that red-dripping half-moon blade if he let himself think it was a woman he swung at. He focused, but other things drifted across his vision as he cut his way forward. A silvery lightning strike hurled cotton sore clad figures into the air, some wearing the scarlet headband, some not. Another bolt threw Dobrain from his horse. The Kyrianen labored to his feet, laying about him with his sword. Fire enveloped the knot of Kyrianen and Aiel. Men and horses turning to screaming torches, those who could still scream. These things passed before his eyes, but he did not let himself see them. There were only the men before him, the brambles, to be cleared by his axe and loyals, and Aram's sword. Then he saw something that pierced his concentration. A rearing horse, a toppling rider being pulled from his saddle as Aiel spears stabbed him. A rider in a red breastplate. And there was another of the winged guards, and a clump of them thrusting their lances, with Norella's plume waving above his helmet. A moment later he saw Karuna, face serenely unconcerned, striding like a queen of battles along a path carved for her by three warders, 
and the fires that leap from her own hands. And there was Bera, and farther over, Faeldrin, and Masuri, and... What under the light were they all doing here? What were any of them doing? They were supposed to be back with the Wise Ones. From somewhere ahead came a hollow boom, like a thunderclap, cutting through the din of screams and shouts. A moment later, a slash of light appeared not twenty paces from him, slicing through several men and a horse like a huge razor as it widened into a gateway. A black-coated man with a sword jumped out of it and went down with a Shido spear through his middle, but a moment later eight or nine more sprang through as the gateway vanished, forming a circle around the fallen man with their swords. With more than swords, some of the Shido who rushed at them fell to a blade, but more simply burst into flame. Heads exploded like melons dropped under stone from a height. Maybe a hundred paces beyond them, Perrin thought he saw another circle of men in black coats, surrounded by fire and death, but he had no time to wonder. Shido were closing around him, too. Setting himself back to back with Loyal and Aram, he slashed and hacked desperately. There was no going forward now. It was all he could do to remain standing where he was. Blood pounded in his ears, and he could hear himself gasping for breath. He could hear Loyal, too, panting like a huge bellows. Perrin knocked aside a stabbing spear with his axe, slashed at another Aiel with a spike on the backswing, caught a spearhead with his hand, unmindful of the bloody gash it made, split a black-veiled face. He did not think they were going to last much longer. Every part of him centered on staying alive for one heartbeat more. Almost every part. One corner of his mind held an image of Fahil and the sad thought that he would not be able to apologize for not coming back to her.